Right, first longer form video in a little while, but um, hopefully this is going to be a useful one. It's on silicosis, and silicosis is one of those things where I heard a lot about when I was starting out in pottery, and I think the majority of people who've spent any time online in kind of pottery forums and things will be aware of it. Um, some people I have bumped into that haven't heard of it at all, and then there's this split between people who aren't worried about it at all and then people who are possibly too worried about it. Um, but it's incredibly hard to know how worried you should be about it. So silicosis is what happens when you breathe in silica. Um, breathe in too much silica over a long period of time, you get a chronic lung condition. It's a bit like breathing in asbestos. It's sort of halfway between breathing in asbestos and breathing in something else with fine particles that doesn't do quite so much damage, like if you breathed in a lot of sawdust. And so you get these really super fine particles, which are called PM 1.0 or 2.5 or 10, each one referring to the, the size, um, but they're, they're the, the particles that are so fine they can go right down into the depth of, depth of your lungs without being filtered out. And that's bad anyway, that's when you um, read about the damage that car pollution can do and the, the toxic air in London, they're looking at PM 2.5 generally and they will have a, a limit for how much PM 2.5 matter there should be in the air over a long period of time. Too much of it goes into your lungs, impairs lung function, bad for health all round. The problem we have is that silica, crystalline silica, is essentially it's a very spiky form of dust which means that it causes scarring in the lungs. The lungs can't remove it. Um, so what they'll do is they'll put scar tissue around the silica uh, and it impairs lung function. So none of that's good. Um, there's no treatment for it. It's a chronic degenerative condition with no treatment. So something you really don't want to get. And it's called potter's rot or used to be called potter's rot because it affects potters because we work a lot with silica. The silica in our glazes I mean, we literally put powdered silica in um, and the silica in clay is a big component in pretty much everything we do. All of the ingredients. So basically just anything, any dust that we create probably has silica in it uh, and that's bad. And you don't want to be breathing in the super fine silica because that'll go right down into your lungs. And so knowing all of that, there's the recommendations that you'll read if you read anything about it online, about how to clean to avoid kicking up dust and you should wear a mask and you really should wear a mask while mixing glazes and it should be a good one there are ones that will filter out 99.9 percent .9 of um, fine dust that's what you want they have different codes in different countries um but if you it shouldn't be hard to find most pottery suppliers will sell you one what i realized when i started looking into this is that you can buy relatively cheaply these air quality monitors so this cost me £100 by Life Basis. I'll put a link in the description. But actually, if you're in America, there's a brand called Purple. Um, and someone was kind enough to send me a list of the tested ones where someone had tested against a known value to see how good, how close to true um, the readings that these were giving. And there's one that is available in the States for $250 um, called I'm pretty sure it's purple, but I'll put the link. Um, I can't find it for sale in the UK. I might import one just uh, so I've got one that I know is accurate, but that scored something like 98% accuracy on this test compared to a calibrated machine. I don't know how accurate this one is. It's only £100, probably not perfectly accurate, but a lot of the cheap ones in this study were in the 80 to 90% accurate. So if this says a number, there's a, a decent chance it's in the right sort of ballpark. So what I've been doing is I have been monitoring how the quality of the air changes as I do things around the studio. So, um, as you can see, this is, I mean, it's taking a moment to settle, but this big number here is the PM 2.5. So that's the one that I've been following mostly. For some reason, on the, um, the document that I was talking about that compared them, the PM 10, which I would have thought would have been, because it's the biggest particle size, I would have thought would have been the easiest one to monitor, like the finer it gets, maybe the more difficult it is to, to measure accurately. That one 
seems to be a very bad measure. The PM 2.5 and the PM 1.0 seem to be the ones you want to check because the PM 10 rarely correlated with the, the thing. So a weird quirk, I don't understand that one. If anyone knows why, please let me know. Anyway, it's reading about 12, 12 to 15. My studio generally, on any given day when I walk in, um, the air will be around that. And all air, you know, I'm within sight of London, if you've got good binoculars. Um, so the air quality is going to vary. Someone had a bonfire near the other day where I could smell smoke. I could smell smoke in the studio because vented the air slightly and it was reading 50. So a relevant point is not the number, but how the number changes. So in this particular case it's at 12. Um, I've just done some trimming and um, I will get on to how things move the number um, and trimming is one of those ones where um, obviously it has an effect but in theory if you're trimming soft clay it doesn't have that much effect. Anything that kicks up dust will change the, the reading. So we can watch getting the dust out of the different grip you can see there's some fine dust so that reading will go up. Now with all these sorts of things you don't want to be breathing in the dust but it's somewhat um, dose dependent. So I, my logic is having looked at videos of the air quality in the places where people are getting silicosis within 10 to 20 years. So there are, there are factories in like the, the Chinese Indian pottery factories where you can't see very far because of the dust. This is haze in the air. And in those places, the incidence of silicosis is high, but it still takes 10 to 20 years to, to do that level of damage. Um, I kind of think so long as you're not breathing in the clouds of dust, you'll be okay. But I would genu generally recommend anything that moves this more than a small amount. I don't know if you saw that went up to about 20. The reason I'm saying this is because obviously you're, you're kind of probably seeing it move and wondering why I'm not wearing a mask. Um, and I generally do wear a mask when doing anything that moves this more than a little bit, but a little bit of movement, it will quickly go back down as it disperses. There's not, that's not a huge amount of silica dust, is my point. Silicosis will be a dose dependent response to how much silica you breathe in. So the goal is to avoid breathing in as any silica, ideally, but minimizing the amount of silica you breathe in. So you don't want to be wearing a, a really high efficiency mask all the time in the studio if you don't have to, because they're not comfortable, but that would be a great way to avoid breathing in any silica. The relevant thing is how the number changes on this. And, um, I know a couple of potters in the UK have since bought this one and I do know that John the Potter is going to do a video on it and I'd imagine his video will be better than mine but I'm really looking forward to seeing his numbers because the ones in the UK, a lot of them have bought this meter because they asked me which one I've got uh, whereas John's got a different one and we're going to be able to compare numbers and it'll be really interesting to see how his relates to mine um, from what he's said to me so far it looks pretty similar, um, uh, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing his numbers. Half the reason that I left all the trimmings in here is I've just done the trimming and you'll get this, you'll get a list of best practices for how you should behave in a studio to reduce silica dust. And the good thing is that I can back up numerically a lot of them. The first thing to do is to minimize the amount of dust you put in the air. Now, there are ways to deal with the dust after you've made it, but the best thing to do is just not to make it. So, um, what I've found is that any handling of dry clay will put dust into the air. Any handling of wet clay probably won't. Certainly not wet, wet clay, but even, so I trimmed these a few minutes ago. Um, and so I can transfer these and they are just starting to go from being soft enough to bend slightly to some of these bits have been sat out long enough that they will crack. And 
that seems to be the real key. If you can get them, if you can move clay while it's still soft enough that it'll bend, you basically won't produce any dust. Um, if it gets to the point of cracking, then each crack will produce a little bit of dust and kick that dust up into the air. So you want to clean up um, wet clay or leather hard clay, but you do not want to be leaving clay to dry. That will have a noticeable impact on the amount of that dust you put up into the air. Um, with mixing glazes, all your powdered ingredients are fine, but they're not all as fine as this. There's only a um, fraction of them that will be that fine. Uh, but even so, you really don't want to be kicking too much dust up from glazing, sorry, from mixing glazes. Um, I found, having done, I've kind of worked through a, a, the glazing process a few times, taking kind of notes as I went, that um, certainly you don't want to be tipping glazes if you can scoop them out with a scoop and gently place them into a container. Um, but even doing that, you will kick up some dust. So if you have the ability to um, mix glazes in front of an extractor or mix glazes outside or have a window open afterwards, that would be good. You want to be wearing a, that's the time you want to be wearing a high filter mask because even gentle movement of glaze ingredients will boost that number to kind of 40 to 50. And you know that all of that increase in PM 2.5 <coughs> will be from silica. Or you do when it's silica and then a lot of the glaze ingredients will have silica in as well. So you really don't want to be breathing in that dust and you know that that number comes from dust that you don't want to be breathing in. So at that point, just wear a mask. Just wear a mask when you're mixing glazes and handling dry ingredients. Um, but the two parts of the process that were particularly bad were I dry mix my ingredients. So what I do is I put all the ingredients into a tub, seal the tub, shake it. And the reason for that is it disperses the bentonite, stops the bentonite clumping. Um, otherwise you've got to fight it to get it through a sieve. So that's quite a good way of dealing with it. The problem is the fine particles will stay in suspension um, even after leaving the, the container sealed for a while. So I generally mix it up. What I would then do is I would go outside and do that part outside. I, depending on what the weather's doing, but I generally would mix the ingredients inside with a view to recycling the air afterwards. But I would do that part outside. You really want to do that part outside if you can. That part shoots the number up to a few hundred on here. And then the most interesting part is that having poured, so I pour my dry ingredients into water in another tub. And the reason for that is that if you put water onto dry ingredients, you'll get that little, like the, the pockets of dry ingredients around the base. Whereas if you add them to water, you don't get that. Um, what was really interesting and I didn't expect was that doing that, um, when the glaze bubbles as it sinks into the water, that kicks up loads of dust. I got this to read up to, it can only go up to 999, and that's what it was reading the air above it. So that is actually probably the worst stage of the glaze making process, if you add dry to wet. I have not yet tested at that scale wet added to dry. I would have thought it would be less bad, but probably not much less bad. And I think what's happening is that bubbles of air trapped within the powder glaze are rising to the surface. And as they do that, they're taking a little bit of powder with it and launching it into the air. So it's kicking the dust up in a way that no other part of the process is. And I don't think that'd be different if you put the water on top. So um, the takeaway from that is that if you're making a glaze, the two parts of the process that you want to be most careful of are pouring dry ingredients that kicks up some dust and as the dry ingredients sink into the water or the water sinks into the dry ingredients that part that part's easily avoided you tip the stuff in you put a lid on you're done so if there's one unexpected thing that i've i'm going to take away from this is that um that stage in the glaze making process is actually one of the most crucial very easily avoided but i I wouldn't even have considered that it was a particularly big thing. 
So um, that's it for glaze making, um, which is one of the biggest things that you can do in terms of producing dust in a studio because there's so all the ingredients are, are powdered. So outside if you can, if not, <clears throat> look to open windows afterwards. You don't necessarily want to be cycling the air while you're doing it because that will encourage otherwise static powders to move but once they're in the air get rid of them so make your glaze open two windows get some airflow through and you should be okay or run uh, an extractor so another thing to avoid so i said about the leaving the trimmings don't don't leave the trimmings to go dry um, same goes for cleaning a wheel or anything like that if you can clean up clay while it's liquid and you mop it or use a sponge you basically produce no dust if you've got dry clay dust or glazed dust and you wipe it with a wet sponge you will create a little dust but not very much uh, if you brush it you'll produce loads so a bit of advice that's generally given is not to sweep a studio um, but only ever mop and that is really borne out by this so that's one thing to take away from this, really don't sweep a studio unless you're gonna wear a mask and then replace all the air afterwards. In which case, I still would recommend a mop from what I've seen, but at least then you'll be mitigating somewhat. Something else to consider is when you trim pieces. As I said, um, I trimmed those at kind of leather hard, which I think is pretty common for trimming. Um, if you can do that and then get rid of the trimmings before they dry, great. If, for whatever reason, you trim a bone dry or anywhere approaching it, and rather than ribbons of clay you're getting dust, you are kicking up the finer particles. You will notice, if you trim like that, you'll notice the PM 2.5 go up. So, um, my recommendation for that is either don't do it, or if you do, um, be aware that you're doing it and take appropriate steps like wearing a mask and dealing with the air afterwards. But I, and then the same is true of sanding. If you're sanding greenware, you have to do it dry because obviously it's greenware and um, any addition of water will turn it back into clay. Um, that will kick up dust and you don't want to breathe that dust in. If you're sanding bisqueware or fully glazed pieces, um, you, can, you have the choice of sanding wet and dry. Um, and as you would expect, sanding uh, dry produces dust and sanding wet, I don't have conclusive numbers because I only did it, I only did one test. Um, there was sort of a tenfold increase sanding dry to sanding wet, but I'm not convinced that actually sanding wet would produce any dust. That might have just been an artifact of um, me moving around more to sand things. So I think there was a certain amount of just the air movement might have changed the number. I will test that one further and get back to you on that because I think there's not going to be any dust produced if you've got a saturated um, sopping wet piece and a piece of sandpaper or one of the diamond i'm using the diamond core sanding pads um you get them sopping wet i don't see how any of the dust is going to make it past that water into the air but i can't tell you that for certain at this point certainly there's a huge reduction in it so sand wet if you can um and if you can't take appropriate precautions um, fabrics, I haven't registered uh, a change in the, the reading from the clothes that I'm wearing. So someone asked about are they taking dust home with them when they wear clothes in the studio and then go home. I don't think you are. I mean it, obviously it would depend what you did that day if you got yourself covered in like literally if you chuck some dust on you, sure you're going to be taking dust home with you, but um, just general studio, not too dirty clothes, um, you're probably fine. That's what I've seen so far. Um, other fabrics in the studio, there's a towel by the sink that kicks up some dust, but equally it leaves behind um, like little bits of the coloured fluff on things. So I'm not convinced that's clay. Some of it will be, but I don't think it's all clay. And the, the mat at the door, uh, if I stomp on it, I get a cloud of dust. Now, obviously, I use that to wipe mud off my shoes. 
Um, so some of that will be mud and you know things like that. Some of that will be silica dust. Uh, so I think, oh, and um, obviously a lot of people use canvas. So for like slab rollers or anything like that, canvas definitely does store dust and does release it. So um, I know from other people telling me, um, and I know from using, so someone else commented that they've got one of these meters or a different meter, and that <clears throat> one of the, the worst sources of dust that they had found was a wet sponging dry canvas. Um, which I was quite surprised at, but in a way I'm not because canvas, you can see the cloud of dust it kicks up. It, I think it has the unique ability, well not unique, but fabrics have the ability to, to break a bit of clay up into the smallest possible pieces because obviously it's bending and crushing it between the fibres. So I think fabrics are particularly bad at kicking up dust and canvas because it's used with clay and the clay can work into it you've got to be a bit careful with. So that's going to be a big source of dust. Um, wash them regularly if you can. Try not to move them about much. Um, I think the from what I've seen, the amount of dust that gets kicked up is proportional to what you do to it. So if you're kind of throwing canvas around, you'll get a completely different result to if you're gentle with it. Um, but I can't tell you that for certain. Uh, I don't actually, I thought I had some canvas in here, but I can't find it. But my, I've um, lent my slab roller to someone, so I can't, I can't test that part of it. But certainly something like a doormat in the studio will gradually pick up dust. Um, and I do wash mine periodically, but possibly not as often as I should. One other thing is that once you put the silica dust in the air, it will stay in the air for a while. That's the problem with the PM2.5 and finer particles. Um, but you can filter them out of the air. And so I've got a HEPA filter that I use for that. And full disclosure, uh, I was sent this for free um, in order to test it. Um, um, this company make HEPA filters and are aware of silicosis and wanted to be the go-to for um, potters to, to get something to filter out silica dust. And this little thing is what they sent me. It's the Viro Cleanse. Um, what it does is it sucks air in through top vents. So there's vents on three sides at the top. There are two filters that it passes through. A little one here and a really chunky filter there. And then clean air comes out the bottom. Um, it's really quiet on its lowest setting. It doesn't kick up any dust. If you've kept your surfaces relatively clean, on its lowest setting, it shouldn't kick up any dust at all. And it does a good job of uh, filtering out the dust as far as I can see with my little meter. It'll take a reading down by about half. So I'll leave it on overnight. And if it was say 16, reading 16, when I left, I'll come back in, it'll be eight. So it's taken the silica out the air, but also um, some of that background level of just you know, car pollution. So yeah, they made it's a really nice little bit of kit. They are pricey. There's kind of no getting around that. Um, and you can get cheaper ones. You you get what you pay for. I have got a cheap one. Um, it's so noisy that I can only run it while I'm not in the studio. Yeah, you've got to weigh up the decision. But at the end of the day, if you're using it as your main source of um, backup for getting stuff out of the air, then you'll get what you pay for. It's well thought out is the main thing. So they're a company, I can't, I respect any company who are prepared to send me something for free and give me free reign as to what I say about it, which they did. Um, so anyone who stands by their product enough to, to give it away and not stipulate what someone has to say about it, probably knows that they've made a good product. And in this case they have, it's expensive. Um, you can get cheap ones, entirely up to you what you do, but I'll put a link to this one in the description. Um, I don't make any money off it, it's not a referral link, it's just, um, yeah, it's just a link. Best practices are probably a better approach to not doing best practices and trying to filter the air, but if you're worried about it, get an air quality meter, get a HEPA filter, get a really good mask, wear the mask when needed, 
you can use this to check that you haven't done anything unintentional um, just periodically make sure your air is okay and then run a HEPA filter overnight uh, if you're worried about the air movement kicking up more dust which to a certain extent it will but I think from what I've seen again with this um, you would have to have a dusty studio and turn a fan on for that to be a big thing so um, you're probably all right there but uh, yeah all in all I don't it's going to vary on a case-to-case -case basis and I'm not qualified to give medical advice but from what I have seen the best practices are enough that you can fairly confidently say you're going to die of something else before silicosis. I don't think from what I have seen that I am in any risk of getting silicosis anytime soon and from that I would have thought that very few potters with relatively clean studios are so just make sure you're a potter with a relatively clean studio you should be fine um, again not medical advice and if you want to be a little bit more sure of it get yourself one of these they come as cheap as 40 pounds or a similar amount in dollars and they won't be perfect but they will give you a, a baseline for your studio and then you can see what you, what changes occur as a result of things you do. Um, and if you do buy one of these, please do some tests. Let me know how your numbers compare to these, because I would love to know. I, I'm going to look into getting one of the purple ones that I know is close to calibrated. If you do buy one of those, um, I'd really love to know your numbers, because that would save me having to buy one. But I'd still be quite interested to see how my behaviour affects it but yeah let me know in the comments if you can think of anything that i haven't covered and i'll i've got a blog post which is basically the same things as everything i've been saying uh, if you want to read through um but let me know if you can think of anything i haven't covered that you want me to try and measure with it and if you get one let me know yeah let me know how your numbers compare to these